welcome back uh, in the last few lectures we talked about many important decision procedure methods starting with the uh, truth table method and then uh, semantic tablux method and then we have come up with uh, uh, semantic uh, res resolution refutation method etc and all and we solved one particular problem uh, with respect to all these methods and then we have seen which method to uh, and we need to employ and all it all depends upon our convenience and all. So far we talked about the different decision procedure methods with which you will come to know whether a given well formed formula is a valid formula or tautology or when two groups of statements are consistent to each other etc. So today I will be talking about uh, another way of doing it which comes under the category of syntactic uh, method so that is the, uh, the axiomatic propositional logic I will be talking about the axiomatic propositional logic in that I will be talking about two different axiomatic systems one is due to the famous uh, uh, Russell and Whitehead they are two mathematicians and all this axiomatic system is due to uh, Russell and Whitehead which is called as Russell and Whitehead axiomatic system which they proposed it in the, uh, in the historic book that is Principia Mathematica. So I will be taking a selective portion of that Principia Mathematica and I will be talking some of the proofs which are already there in that book. So this comes under one particular chapter which is based on deduction in propositional logic. So I am restricting my attention to uh, my focus on uh, propositional logic. So we will be mostly talking about Russell and Whitehead axiomatic system. So now in this lecture what I will be doing is uh, these are the things which I would be doing. So first I will talk about what I mean by an axiomatic system how it has originated etc. And then within the axiomatic system uh, what occupies the central position is a proof a proof of what a given theorem. So we will be talking about these uh, specific key terms such as axiom proof what do you mean by deduction what do you mean by uh, saying that a particular uh, proposition a particular statement is considered to be a lemma or conjecture or corollary etc. These are the things which you commonly come across uh, within the proof theory. So usually a proof is considered to be uh, a finite sequence of steps which ends in finite intervals of time. So if your proof ends in finite steps in finite intervals of time then usually it is considered as an effective proof. So how did we how did we come to this particular kind of rigorous proofs and all. So what is wrong with the, uh, the proofs that are already uh, existing in the Euclidean geometry. Euclidean geometry is also considered to be one of the important axiomatic systems but still we do not treat it as, uh, as rigorous as this uh, that we find it in uh, in the Principia Mathematica. So what is the reason for that particular kind of thing I will talk about it in a in a nutshell. And then I move on to a different kind of axiomatic system which uh, derives its motivation from axiomatizing geometry. Uh, Principia Mathematica is motivated by uh, motivation has come from the arithmetic whereas Hilbert Ackerman axiomatic system the motivation comes from the geometry. So then we will see uh, with the help of deduction theorem uh, we will be simplifying some of the proofs that are there in either in. Uh, Russell weighted axiomatic system or in the Hilbert Ackerman axiomatic system and then we will talk about some of the important meta theoretic theorems such as soundness. So that is whether all the things that you are proving are going to be true or not usually in the proof the last step is considered to be a proof which is always obviously considered to be true. If it is a true or tautology then it has to find a uh, some kind of decision procedure we, we need to find a decision with the help of decision procedure method we should be in a position to check whether it is a valid formula or not. The soundness ensures that all the things that you have derived are true and the completeness uh, uh, assures us that all the true propositions finds some kind of proof and consistency uh, is a natural property which is in any given point of time you cannot derive both x and not x. So in this lecture I will be focusing my attention on the origin of uh, axiomatic system and then partly I will be talking about Russell Whitehead axiomatic system and some of the important proofs within that uh, uh, axiomatic system due to Russell and Whitehead. So the origin of uh, axiomatic system uh, is usually like this usually we find uh, axiomatic system 
or uh, either in the Aristotelian framework or even in the Euclid's uh, uh, in the Euclid in the works of Euclid that is elements. So Euclid has come up with five postulates and then the few definitions and then there are some common notions and with the help of uh, these common notions definitions and uh, axioms he considers that he views it as postulates with that all the other true propositions are two propositions in geometry are derived. So in the 90 uh, in the mid 19th century mathematicians started finding flaws in the Euclidean axioms. So there is a fifth postulates which uh, uh, which is which is objectionable. So the flaws in the Euclidean axioms in the geometry uh, led to this particular kind of uh, axiomatic systems. So the work uh, of Karge in 1998 uh, he found flaw in the Euclidean axioms as the postulates usually the fifth postulates is highly debated in all whether or not to replace that particular kind of postulate or change it uh, change it in a such a way that uh, you can talk about a different kind of geometry. So after in the mid 19th century different geometries have come into existence Riemann geometry Cauchy's uh, Gauss uh, has come up with another kind of thing etc. All these things comes under the category of non-Euclidean geometry. So, in addition to the independence of the parallel postulates established by another Russian mathematician, Lobachevsky, mathematician discovered that certain theorems taken, uh, the certain theorems in Euclidean geometry are taken for granted by Euclid, were not in fact provable by using his own axioms. So, there are two problems with uh, this Euclidean geometry. The first thing is is that uh, the fifth postulates postulate has created problem and people have come up with various other kinds of geometry and all uh, and the other thing is is that there are so many commonsensical notions uh, direct observations etc which are not part of part and parcel of your proof they are already present in the proof and all. There are certain things which are outside the proof and uh, unfortunately they are also part of the proof and all. So we need to separate all this. Uh, uh, all this common uh, if you want to have a rigorous kind of proof everything needs to be stated explicitly and uh, there should not be any notion which is uh, which is not part of the proof uh, that should uh, play a role in the uh, in deriving some kind of theorems and all. So among this uh, 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 this is a theorem that this is the fifth postulate uh, which tells us that a line contains at least two points are that circles of some same radius whose centers are whose centers are separated by that radius must intersect. So this uh, has uh, created a problem and all and then it led to different kinds of uh, uh, theories whether uh, whether the angles total uh, sides of the angles uh, of a triangle angle of a triangle is considered to be 180 or greater than 180 etc all these questions arose. So this is one uh, thing which led to uh, think in a different way uh, the non Euclidean geometry or making the proofs more rigorous and all that was Hilbert was taking up in his axiomatic system. And the other thing is that there are concerns that mathematics uh, had been built on and not been built on proper foundations. So Frege has built it uh, built an axiomatic system so that led to some kind of paradoxes we usually mathematics was rested on set theory, but set theory is plagued by important paradoxes which was discovered by Russell and Whitehead and this uh, these paradoxes plague this uh, kind of uh, axiomatic system um, that also led uh, to the development of rigorous axiomatic system uh, that is what you find it in Principia Mathematica. There are between Russell and Whitehead's motivation has come from some of the paradoxes. Uh, that are that arose in the work of Frege. A set theory is plagued with paradoxes. It uh, and there was issues in the geometry, and then Hilbert Ackermann took geometry into consideration and axiomatized geometry and all. These discovery of uh, paradoxes in informal set theory cause someone to wonder whether mathematics itself is consistent or not. And to look for proofs of consistency, etc. and all. So there are two things which we need to note uh, the developments of uh, Euclidean geometry led to 
some kind of rigorous kind of uh, axiomatic system uh, which is a uh, little bit different from what Euclid has done that is uh, uh, in, in your proof if you if your proof has to be rigorous all the commonsensical notions direct observations etc should not be uh, it might be mistaken and all uh, we might it, it might be very well be the case that our intuitions might be misleading you know so in that sense uh, everything has to be stated explicitly and then from that all the true, pe true things can be derived and all so for that you need to come up with a few axioms as, as much as possible and then few transformation rules etc and then you derive all the other true things so that is what uh, we have discussed so far we discussed uh, syntactic and semantic decision procedures semantic decision procedures are truth table semantic tableaus etc and all syntactic procedures we have natural deduction etc and all okay. and another method added to that we have this axiomatic propositional logic where uh, we are not interested in talking about the meaning of these formulas and all but we will be interested in uh, some of the patterns etc and all so for given the axioms we will be deriving some kind of theorems so now in this 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 is axiomatic propositional calculus comes under the category of syntactic kind of proofs and all which we will be talking about in greater detail so in this we intend that proofs in propositional logic should provide demonstrations of formal truths that means you are deriving all the true propositions from a given set of uh, you can call it a self evident uh, truths or uh, things which cannot be uh, proved etc and all they are all axioms and derivation should provide deductions of the formal sequences of assumptions and all if that is the case then that is what we are trying to do that means in, in a nutshell all the true propositions so that you come across all the valid formulas now we are trying to generate proofs for those things so it is not that they came just like that but uh, as an outcome of some of the axioms and the transformation rules you will generate these theorems in addition we would like our formal system to be rich enough for all formally true formulas of L to be provable that means all the true propositions that you come across in your formal axiomatic system have to be provable it has to find a proof you say that uh, something is true and it, you do not have a proof that will not work and all so you need to have a kind of proof for all the true propositions that ensures that all the true propositions will find a proof and for a well formed formula A to be derivable from a set of formulas gamma whenever the argument from gamma to A is usually considered as formally valid all the true propositions also have to be valid so now these are some of the examples of axiomatic systems Principia Mathematica and Hilbert Ackerman axiomatic system there may be many other axiomatic systems but I will be talking about mainly these two axiomatic systems so to begin with what do you mean by an axiomatic system so an axiomatic system either you can take it as a Hilbert Ackerman axiomatic system or Principia Mathematica that is Russell Whitehead axiomatic system uh, it is defined as follows at least uh, these are the four uh, five things which uh, essentially any axiomatic system should con consist of the first thing is, is that a set of well formed formulas are usually called as axioms these axioms need not have to be proved and all so there are considered to be self evident truths which are obviously true always true and all and then these axioms will also serve as schemas schemas in a sense that uh, you substitute anything into it uniformly you will generate a theorem so that is the uh, greatness of this axioms and these things does not require any proof that is why they are well uh, self evident kind of truths in addition to that there are some set of rules of inference which licenses some kind of operations on well formed formulas of uh, propositional calculus that means uh, whatever you intend to have as an operation will not work and all but there are some set of rules like uh, rules of inference such as modus ponens or uh, transformation rules such as uh, if you uniformly substitute some formula into the formula then then also you will generate theorems from the axioms so this is the second thing you need to have transformation rules such as modus ponens etc and all as minimal as possible in any given axiomatic system these rules would be very minimal and the third thing 
you need to have a set of well formed formulas in the propositional logic uh, propositional calculus which can be obtained from the axioms by means of rules of inference that is usually only one rule of inference is uh, usually used that is the modus ponens rule. So when you have A implies B and A, A gets detached and whatever you whatever follows is B that is the main uh, rule of inference which we commonly use in all the in throughout the axiomatic systems whatever axiomatic system you are trying to consider. The fourth one these new well formed formulas are usually called as theorems of the system that means you started with the axioms and then you transformed those axioms or you trimmed those axioms in such a way that by applying transformation rules and uh, uh, truth preserving rules such as modus ponens you generated another kind of inference. So the, our path is like this that uh, our path is like each and every step starts with the truth that is the axiom which is obviously true and then you for if you apply transformation rules on these axioms and the resultant uh, well formed formula is also going to be true and then that gets transformed into another well formed formula that is also going to be true each step is considered to be true. So in that sense the last step of your proof is also going to be true if all the steps that are there in the deduction process is already true and the last step of your proof which is usually called as a theorem is obviously considered to be true. So establishing the validity is another kind of issue but uh, deriving a kind of true formula from a given uh, sequence of formulas is another issue. So lastly uh, that uh, we use uh, a particular kind of uh, term uh, that is what we call it as thesis thesis is like some kind of uh, it can be taken as either axiom or it can be even taken as a theorem. So in order to say that uh, uh, any uh, well formed formula is a axiom or even a theorem sometimes we use this word thesis. So every thesis is obviously considered to be a well valid well formed formula of a given field and every valid formula of that field is also considered to be a thesis of the system either it should be an axiom or it should be a theorem all the valid formulas it should be one of the one of the things should be true either it should be an axiom which does not require any proof or it can be proved by reducing the given axioms by using transformation rules and rules of inference to another kind of theorem and all. So this is what we mean by an axiomatic system so in a nutshell an axiomatic system should consist of at least set of axioms to start with either you can have 3 or you can have 4 or you can have 5 but as minimal as possible to start with and then you apply transformation rules substitution rules etc and all you transform these axioms into another thing which are also considered to be theorems and then you need to have some kind of rule of inference that is uh, usually we use it as modus ponens that is all you want uh, to derive all the true propositions that occurs in your formal logical system. So now there are certain terms which needs to be defined uh, clearly before moving further otherwise it will create some kind of confusion. So the moment axioms uh, the, the word axiom postulates etc they are one of the same Euclid has used this uh, particular kind of phrase postulates which more or less uh, means the same thing as axiom that, that that is what we are trying to use in the modern uh, mathematics in particular. So an axiom is considered to be a statement usually a statement is considered to be either true or false that is assumed to be true without any proof and all it does not require any proof for example uh, we will be presenting some uh, this axiomatic system Russell and Whitehead axiomatic system suppose if he says that these are my five axioms that means any one of these axioms cannot be deduced from any other axiom and all. So that means one axiom should not reduce to another one. So it so happened that uh, Paul Bernays uh, the logician which was come later contemporary to Britain Russell and Whitehead he came up with uh, a proof of his fifth uh, this is fifth axiom of Russell Whitehead axiomatic system can be deduced from other axioms and all. in that sense it loses his uh, status of axiom it will become a theorem. So when Russell and Whitehead formulated his axi their axiomatic system it has five uh, axioms and all. Suppose if it is proved any axiom is proved from any other thing then it is uh, considered to be a theorem it will lose this axiomatic status. So coming up with this axioms is the most uh, difficult kind of thing. So axiom is a sentence which does not require any proof they are like self evident kind of truths 
uh, in order to start any uh, any branch any field of enquiry either you are talking about physics or mathematics or anything one needs to start with some kind of metaphysical assumptions for example when you are when you are studying physics in particular concept of matter and all these things you will be asking several questions and all how the matter has come into existence uh, then you will date you will go back to uh, some billions of years ago and then you start uh, saying that uh, there was a big bang and then from uh, then uh, due to the big bang then uh, it has resulted in some kind of uh, hot planets etc you know hot uh, things and all and it started cooling cooling and all and different planets have formed etc our universe has originated by means of big bang you know. so now if you go back and ask uh, how this big bang took place and all we are all silent and all in these cases so we assume that there was a big bang and then from that all the universe has originated so in the same way when you are talking about um, theology or something like that you will have your metaphysical assumptions such as uh, God has created this universe in six days and seventh day he took rest etc so you need to start with some kind of metaphysical assumptions to do anything to start any kind of enquiry and all so in the same way in the axiomatic system you need to start with axioms which does not require any proof and all they are self evident kind of uh, statements which are obviously true it is like 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 which cannot be questioned and all of course one can even question the foundations of uh, uh, any area and all or you can start questioning uh, the axioms. Uh, but usually it is the case that they are assumed to be true without any proof so these are also considered to be basic building building blocks from which all the other things can be constructed just like you are constructing a building you need to have bricks and bricks are arranged in certain way and then you will build nice structures and all examples could be Euclid's five postulates Jan Miller Frankel axioms or Pianos axioms in arithmetic etc Jan Miller Frankel axioms in the set theory so now what you what you mean by a theorem a theorem is a mathematical statement that is proved using some kind of rigorous mathematical reasoning that is what we, we spoke about it in extensive detail that is a deduction a deduction uh, is uh, considered to be a deductive argument is considered to be an argument in which uh, if your premises are uh, uncertain they are absolutely true etc so that is what we mean by deduction in a mathematical any mathematical paper that you come across the term theorem is often reserved for the most important results and if you consider any mathematical research paper and all it is often considered as one of the important results that is considered to be a theorem and that needs to have a proof in mathematics if you say that uh, I, I have come up with a theorem and then if I do not show I mean uh, that it is it can be proved and all that, is, that will never serve as a theorem and all you need to provide a rigorous proof for whatever result that you are trying to talk about in a mathematical paper so in a nutshell the last step of your proof is what is considered to be a true statement that is considered to be a theory a theorem so now uh, uh, most of the time we will be using these words lemma uh, whenever you are reading some kind of mathematical uh, mathematics books and all you will be seeing all these axioms theorems lemmas corollaries etc what do you mean by lemma it is a minor result whose sole purpose is to help in proving a particular kind of theorem so they are supporting kind of theorems so it is a stepping stone on the path of proving certain kind of theorems so the minor kind of important steps that you will be taking up in proving the major theorems so that is what we call it as a lemma and there are some other terms which are also very important so they are like this so what these are the terms which you commonly come across uh, when you are reading a mathematical paper or any other mathematical textbook a corollary a corollary is an important result which the proof relies heavily on a given theorem so we often say that uh, this is a corollary of a theorem a etc and all this is a some kind of thing which comes as an outcome of your particular kind of theorem so this is uh, what is called as a corollary and preposition is the one which we have been discussing right from the beginning of this course that is any sentence which is usually considered to be either true or false uh, that is called as a preposition so it, it can also in, in the context of mathematics it is a proved and often interesting result but generally less important than a theorem a theorem is considered to be the most rigorous kind of uh, statement and all in your uh, inquiry 
and of course axioms are all which, which does not require any proof and all they are absolutely true and all which does not require any proofs. So now the other term which you come across is uh, the conjecture. So conjecture is considered to be a statement that is yet to be proved and all it is unproved as of now but it is believed to be true. And all. So there are many such conjectures which are uh, our gut feeling says that they are obviously true and all they are all true statements but as of now they it did not find any proof. In the same way uh, when Fermat has proposed Fermat's last theorem uh, it took almost 200 three, two to 300 years to prove this Fermat's last theorem and all till that time it remained as a conjecture till somebody uh, some mathematician has come up with a rigorous proof for the Fermat's last theorem. Conjectures are yet to be proved kind of theorems and all we are our gut feelings tells us that they are obviously true but still I did not find any I would not be in a position to find a rigorous proof for that. So this is what we call as a conjecture so all these conjectures can be refuted or maybe it can be proved also. So till we find a rigorous proof for this conjecture we will not accept it as a theorem but all conjectures may be potentially capable of becoming theorems once it finds a rigorous proof. The last thing that we will be using in the in this context is the claim a claim is an assertion in any mathematical paper you will be coming across this particular kind of thing. So in any research paper etc and all you will be claiming something so that is considered to be an assertion that is then obviously eventually it is going to be proved it is slightly different from the conjecture conjecture is the one which our gut feeling tells us that it is obviously true it is often used like some kind of informal lemma it is not lemma as such but it is considered to be a kind of informal kind of lemma so that is what is called as a claim. So now given this set of keywords etc and all what is that we are essentially trying to do this is that we are presenting one particular kind of axiomatic system which is in which the proofs are considered to be rigorous. Uh, as well as there are no other kind of uh, hidden kind of assumptions which will become part and parcel of your uh, proof I mean uh, just as in the case of Euclidean axioms there are certain extra assumptions etc which has come which, which also played a, a crucial role in formulating the proofs uh, within the geometry we want to be we want to avoid such kind of thing so our proof have proofs have to be rigorous so what do you mean by a proof. So now we have axioms, theorems, lemmas, corollaries, conjectures, etc., and all claims, propositions. Now, with using these things, what do you mean by a proof? So usually, a proof is considered to be a sequence of formulas, and all these formulas will find some kind of justification. So each step needs to be justified by uh, some kind of uh, a statement uh, that is uh, either whether you used modus ponens rule or you used transformation rule or it has come from axiom or it has it is just another kind of theorem all these things needs to be uh, addressed. So each line of the proof in the axiomatic system L it should have uh, this particular kind of things. So in a proof uh, either uh, that particular kind of thing has to be an axiom that means it does not need any proof and all you just write it and end it like that you say that that is an axiom that itself is a since it does not require any proof and all so that itself will be some kind of thesis and all thesis is the one which we have introduced earlier in that context we say that it is a theorem it is as well as an axiom also because the last step of your proof is considered to be a theorem so if you are given axiom and all you do not it will not require any proof and all then obviously it is considered to be a thesis so that is an exceptional kind of thing and all it is obviously a tautology etc and all so an axiom does not require any proof suppose if we come up with the proof of that one it will lose its axiomatic status so that is the first thing that you need to have and the second thing is is that the next step whatever step that you are trying to consider whether or not it is a result of applying some kind of transformation applying some kind of rules of inference one rule of inference that we will be commonly using is the modus ponens rule that is a a plus b and b follows from that particular kind of thing or 
you can begin your proof by assuming some kind of thing like uh, it can be considered as an hypothesis which is already a part of your the given formula that needs to be proved. So we discussed uh, in the context of natural reduction method suppose if you are trying to prove a plus b b plus c and a plus c. So now what you will do is you list out all the uh, hypothesis that is a plus b b plus c and in addition to that you will assume the antecedent of the con conclusion that is a and from these three whether or not c can be deduced is the one which we are trying to see either it should be a hypothesis which comes from the given formula and all or it must be uh, some kind of a lemma which is a supporting kind of theorem which is also considered to be true. So our journey starts from truth that is the axiom and transfer apply transformation rules to it that is also true and then we are using uh, truth preserving rules such as modus ponens etc and all it is a deductive kind of reasoning. So that is also obviously absolutely true etc and all each step is considered to be truth so that is why our journey ends with the final step of your proof that is considered to be a theorem. So the last step of your proof is usually considered to be a theorem. So you need to note that uh, one can come to the destination in, uh, in finite steps and all some sometimes you can come up with uh, 15 steps to find the final kind of uh, reach the destination that is the theorem or sometimes you might prove the same thing uh, within some 10 steps and all. So the proof which consists of 10 steps is obviously considered to be a rigorous kind of uh, or effective kind of proof when compared to a proof which consists of 15 steps or you know, maybe more than that. So as far as possible or in uh, excessive information should not be there to maintain informational economy and in order to make these proofs effective your proof has to be uh, the steps of your proof has to be as minimal as possible. So when we write this thing L singleton style A that means A is considered to be deduced from L since A is considered to be the last step of your proof so A is called as a theorem. So that means we write Z1, Z2, Z n etc is a conjunction of all these formulas usually it can be it can be called as premises etc and A is considered to be the conclusion and that is deduced within the formal system L if and only if, if A finds a proof in a given formal system from a given set of formulas Z1, Z2, Z n etc. It says that if we have a proof of this thing Q from P then we are guaranteed that we have a proof of P plus Q as well. So this is a sort of deduction theorem which was later uh, introduced by Herbrand etc and all. So we will talk about this particular kind of deduction theorem a little bit later. So what essentially we are trying to do is uh, from Q if Q is obtained from P then uh, you discharge your assumptions uh, like P, Q etc and all and you will start talking about P implies Q rather than just P and just Q. So now there are in the elementary I mean suppose if you go back to our elementary uh, schooling etc and all in, the, in our childhood we might have derived certain uh, proofs which are considered to be bogus proofs you know, but it might have convinced uh, us at that stage. So let us assuming uh, let us assume that whether or not this constitute uh, to be a, a genuine proof or it is a bogus proof or it requires some kind of fixing etc and all fixing the problem that arises in one of these steps and all. So what is considered to be a proof so far we have discussed that each step has to be true and it should find a justification if a justification is wrong then you cannot move to the further step. So uh, there means some this proof is considered to be defective or uh, there seems to be some problem with the proof. So now observe this particular kind of proof 2 is equivalent to 1. So for that you start with uh, uh, some assumptions let us assume that uh, a is equivalent to b then you multiply a both sides and the, se the second step you will get a square is equal to a b now you add a square to both the uh, both sides and all LHS and RHS then it will become the third step that is a square plus a square is equal to a square plus a b because you have added a square to, uh, to both sides LHS and RHS. So now the, in the step 3 LHS will become 2 a square equivalent to a square plus a b. So now uh, you subtract 
minus 2 a b both sides this is what you get. So that is 2 a square minus the sixth step 2 a square minus 2 a b and a square minus a b. So now you take two common of these things uh, 2 into a square minus a b and 1 into a square minus a b. So it is like uh, 2 into a square minus a b is equal to 1 into a square minus a b. So this is what you got it from a is equal to b all the way down you got this particular kind of step till here it does not seem to be a little bit problematic and all because we have started with all these assumptions etc and all we are not just done anything etc except that we are added subtracting from both sides etc and all. So now the problem real uh, real problem comes from uh, is, is that the moment you cancel these two things then suppose if you say that uh, so this is the n minus 1 step and this is the nth step you cancel a square minus a b both sides and then you will infer that 2 is equal to 1 because you can say that a square minus a b and a square minus a b uh, it will become 2 is equal to 1. But uh, one of the important principles in the logic is, is that uh, you cannot cancel in such a way that you know a square minus a b from both sides because when especially when a is equal to b then a square minus a b uh, usually it will become uh, so when a is equal to b it is uh, substitute for uh, a b and all becomes b square because it is uh, b into b is b square so now it will become 0 so 0 uh, cannot be cancelled with another 0 and all so it is in that sense our principles of mathematics will not permit us to move from uh, uh, this it will not allow us to cancel this particular kind of step and all. So now this will not uh, lead us to the next step because there was some problem with the justification our justification is defective and all because 0 cannot be cancelled by 0. So that is not permitted in at least in the principles of arithmetic so that will not let us allow that 2 is equal to 1 of course if you do not notice it properly and all the sideline this particular kind of thing it, it appears that you know it appears to be a wonderful or nice proof and all but uh, you can uh, you can stop at step number 7 and you can question how did you cancel a square minus a b both sides and all 0 cannot be cancelled by 0 0 cannot be cancelled by 0. So this step is not allowed so that is the reason why uh, this itself the proof itself starts stops here and then you need not have to talk about this particular kind of thing. So now each step of your proof needs to be justified uh, so here there was a problem with the justification it goes against the principles of arithmetic so you will not generate a proof for 2 is equal to 1 if you generate a proof for 2 is equal to 1 and then say that this is your effective proof and all then this is not considered to be an effective proof it is a bogus kind of proof. So then the, the next question that comes to us uh, is, is that what constitutes an effective proof so as it appears that uh, from this particular kind of thing what we can learn from this particular kind of proof is, is that uh, if your proof has to be effective etc and all each step should find a justification that should be according to the principles of logic etc. Uh, uh, in the same way when you are talking about axiomatic system which is based on set of axioms and uh, transformation rules etc uh, that thing has to I mean each step needs to be justified either by uh, using the axiom or transformation rules applied on axiom or it should be it should result in from by up, uh, result in from applying some kind of modus ponens principle or I mean any one of these things should be there then only the, the next step is going to be justified but here the seventh step is a problematic step your proof ends there itself and you can you can cl clearly say that 2 cannot be equivalent to 1. So there are certain things which are, which are very important uh, mathematicians would always be interested in starting with the tautologies that means the true statements a mathematician will never begin with contradictions 
the contradiction is a one a sentence which can be spoken as both true and both false and all x and not x is kind of inconsistent statement is unsatisfiable and also considered to be contradictory to each other p and not p is contradictory to each other. So why mathematicians think that uh, uh, this uh, uh, the contradictions are going to be considered to be as a hell. So here is uh, one of the interesting and funny kind of uh, example which is given by uh, a famous mathematician again uh, in the cont since we are talking about Russell Whitehead axiomatic system. So this example is also due to Russell and Whitehead uh, Russell Betton Russell in one of the parties uh, which he attended he, he funnily proved that a contradiction implies anything. So that is the reason why you know uh, one uh, mathematicians will always be loving uh, this uh, tautologies etc and all from truths you generate truths etc and all. But when you start with the contradiction you can derive anything. So this is what is the thing uh, uh, it just gives a funny kind of proof so that is like this, this is what Betton Russell says if 2 plus 2 is equal to 5 that is a false statement a false statement implies anything. Then he is trying to prove any strange kind of proposition that you know that he is going to be a pope. He wants to establish himself that if two plus is going to going to be five, then he is going to establish that uh, I am going to be a pope. I miss Betton Russell here. So now, so these are this is the proof that he tries to give. It's a funny kind of proof and all. This not be taken very seriously and all. But uh, usually mathematicians would love to start with truths, uh, tautologies are rather than the contradictions because contradiction leads to hell. So now the proof goes like this if 2 plus 2 is equal to 5 then uh, if you subtract 3 from both sides so that is uh, like this first you take the antecedent of uh, this particular kind of thing. So now our assumption is, is that 2 plus 2 is equal to 5 so now 2 plus 2 minus 3 you substituted minus 3 from both sides subtract uh, sorry not sub, substitute sub, subtract 3 from both sides so this is what you get so now 4 minus 3 is 1 and this is equivalent to 2 so this is the proof and all so this is your hypothesis 2 plus 2 is equal to 5 you are assuming that that is true if that is true then the next step that is 2 plus 2 minus 3 uh, 5 minus 3 is also has to be true that means 1 is 2 is also true now uh, the third step is, is that is funnily he has used it it is not a rigorous kind of proof and all it, uh, is only is this proof is only used for the sake of fun. So now Betton Russell says that Betton Russell and Pope are two different people Betton Russell suppose one is taken as a Betton Russell and two means that Betton Russell and Pope are two different things. So now this equation tells us that Betton Russell and Betton Russell and Pope uh, viewed it in different way they are one of the same. Since one is already equivalent to two Betton Russell and Betton Russell and Pope also has to be same even if there is a, another person exist in all Pope the two has to be equivalent to one. So it is in that sense Betton Russell and Pope are considered to be one person so that means he has to be none other than Pope himself so that means he proved that uh, he is the Pope so this is a funny kind of example and all so which uh, this is uh, this has come from this thing that falsity implies anything so this uh, the same thing which can be proved in classical logic uh, in a different way by using the principles of logic so that is the reason why we do not begin with contradictions in a given proof for example you start with uh, P and not P. so this is we know that it is an apparent contradiction a statement cannot be both true and both false. So now uh, this is what is given uh, if you assume that this is true and even these are also true because of this particular kind of principles so this eliminate this conjunction then P will become true and in P and not P not P is also going to be true. So what we have done is we have eliminated this conjunction so this is what is called as impossibility or, or something which is a contradiction 
So now fourth one since um, not P is already true is also con always considered to be true then irrespective of whether or not Q is true or Q is false the whole statement is going to be true because of this particular kind of uh, formula this we know that the semantics of disjunction is like this that if it is F and F T F T F and all then it is going to be false only in this case in all other cases it is going to be true. So now we know that this is already true so that means these are the two things which you need to take into consideration instead of P we have not P here so now irrespective of whether Q is P whether Q is false the P or Q is going to be true only so in that sense this statement is also true so now in the fifth step uh, you have P here not P or Q now so these two so how did we come to this one this is law of addition so now this and this 3 and 4 uh, sorry 2 and 4 uh, disjunctive syllogism leads to this one Q so that means uh, any particular kind of uh, strange preposition one can prove so starting from the contradiction suppose if you say that it is raining and it is not raining then the statement is going to be pigs flies and all Q is considered to be pigs flies so this is uh, uh, one way of uh, proving this thing so now the problem here is is that uh, you can prove either Q and even you, you can even prove not Q also so how can you get this uh, not P again the same proof first step you take the same assumptions and 4 uh, so instead of uh, this one what we try to do is since P is already true you can add any strange kind of uh, preposition Q and this is also going to be true so now fifth one so this this is law of addition as is the case of this particular kind of thing so now observe these two 3 and 4 disjunctive syllogism will lead to not Q so now with the contradiction you proved not Q and you with the contradiction even you proved Q and all so that makes your system inconsistent since you have derived Q and not Q is part of your uh, formal system whatever system you are trying to talk about L so it is in that sense your formal logical system is going to be inconsistent so that is what we are trying to avoid so this uh, eventually led to different kinds of uh, uh, theorems which are a little bit counterintuitive and all like paradox of material implication which we talk about it after we introduce uh, Russell Whitehead axiomatic system so now with this particular kind of note I will try to end it and the all other proofs etc we will try to do it in the next lecture. So now what is that Russell and Whitehead has achieved in the book Principia Mathematica the lots of things which he did it is a voluminous kind of work and all which consists of three books ranging from 400 to 500 pages each book has 400 pages so now Bertrand Russell and Whitehead in the book Principia Mathematica which is considered to be a path breaking kind of book one of the greatest books of this 19th, 20th century in that it is a kind of some kind of constructivist project constructed proofs etc it, it suit to show that all arithmetic can be reduced to logic that means there are two things which are important here. Uh, when you, whenever you talk about some statement in the arithmetic that can uh, find an appropriate translation in the logic that means if you if you utter any statement in the arithmetic it will have its corresponding language um, you can discuss everything with the help of only this axioms uh, transformation rules and other things so this grand program is what is considered to be uh, a program which is called as the logicism so logicism is like this so the thesis of logicism is that all the mathematical concepts are definable in terms of logical concepts so 
that means you express any kind of plus operation or anything in arithmetic etc that has its corresponding logical operation that means it is in that sense you can talk all the mathematical truths in, in terms of logical truths logical truths are axioms etc and all. So any kind of mathematical statement can be converted into an appropriate appropriately into a corresponding logical statement and all the mathematical modes of inference are reduced to logical mode of modes of inference and it is in that sense all mathematical knowledge is nothing but a real logical knowledge. So, uh, so the basic idea here is, is that mathematics is uh, a branch of logic or all the mathematical concepts can be reduced into the concepts of logic. For example, if you if you come up with an axiomatic system, which consists of uh, only the set of axioms and transformation rules and the rules of inference, as minimal as possible, uh, rules are as minimal as possible, and then you start talking everything in the language of this axiomatic system. So, what is there in our language of uh, axiomatic system with respect to Principia Mathematica? We have some Russell and Whitehead has five axioms, and then there is a, a transformation rules and substitution rules and then the modus ponens principle that is it that is all we have and all the truths of mathematics arithmetic etc they can be appropriately translated into this one of these axioms and all. all the p in plus q in plus etc will become statements of arithmetic and all. if you can do that particular kind of thing then it attains its rigor and all. because whenever you are proving certain kind of theorem such as simple theorems like p in plus p or law of excluded middle etc and all that can be this p's q's r's can be some of the statements in mathematics. So now we are generating all the mathematical theorems we are trying to show that they will come as a logical theorems now. So mathematical knowledge will now turn out to be a logical knowledge because we are using only axioms and modus ponens etc and all. So this is what we do. Uh, in the Principia Mathematica, uh, so mathematics can be appropriately reduced to logic. So now uh, there are other things which uh, uh, Russell and Whitehead is trying to achieve. The other major uh, historical figures in the constructivist camp, so how did they construct? They constructed various kinds of theorems based on few set of rules, which are few set of axioms, rules, and the transformation substitution rules. There are lots of other axiomatic systems uh, uh, which are already there uh, before Russell and Whitehead we have Frege's axiomatic system and Cantor and of course after that David Hilbert was trying to axiomatize geometry and he has come up with uh, axiomatic system David Hilbert's axiomatic system and Paul Bernays especially showed that one of the axioms of Russell Whitehead can no longer have that particular kind of status. We have different axiomatic systems and Piano Sardomatic also comes under this particular kind of category all the mathematics should be developed through appropriate definitions uh, in the systems of logic defined in the Principia if you can achieve that particular kind of task and all then you are said to have reduced mathematics to logic uh, in the sense mathematics is considered to be a branch of logic. So all the arithmetic analysis the other things which you commonly come across in the mathematics Z theory etc if this can be reduced to a set of concepts of logic then it can uh, be called as developments of pure logic rather than the development of mathematics. So in the next class what we will be doing is uh, we will be focusing our attention on uh, the main book the Principia Mathematica uh, due to Betton Russell and Whitehead where uh, there is a chapter spe specific chapter on deduction where uh, using his set of axioms uh, set of axioms he showed that uh, for example law of contradiction law non contradiction law of excluded middle law of identity etc can be derived from this set of axioms so you should note that we, we should note that any formal axiomatic system that you are going to come up with at least you know we have to ensure that one should be in a position to derive the minimal things such as law of excluded middle that is a sentence is either true or false or law of identity such as p implies p etc all these things should come as theorems in your axiomatic system in the next class using the principles uh, using the axioms uh, the, uh, of Russell Whitehead 
will be proving certain important theorems such as law of identity, law of excluded middle, law of contraposition all these things are valid, uh, uh, valid theorems. So now what is that we are trying to achieve in a nutshell is, is that uh, we know that certain kinds of uh, valid formulas exist in our formal logical system. So now we are trying to find a rigorous proof for this valid formulas, valid well formed formulas. So that is what we are trying to achieve and this will constitute uh, part of the proof theory. So once we introduce this uh, axiomatic systems then we will discuss about whether or not your uh, when a given axiomatic system is going to be consistent that means uh, when you will be in a position whether whether or not you are in a position to derive both x and not x if you are if you if you are able to derive x and not x as your theorem in your axiomatic system that axiomatic system is going to be inconsistent or we will be talking about all the valid formulas whether it, it finds proof etc and all so that is uh, all the true statements are provable and all the provable statements are true that is a soundness property or whether your formal axiomatic system is going to be complete etc and what are the limitations etc all these things we will discuss in the forthcoming classes.